this is Our Voices, Our Legacies, the Medical College of Wisconsin's Oral History Project. Mm -hmm. Today is February 16th, 2017. I'm Dick Katchke, MCW's Chief Historian. And we're talking today with Dr. Ivor Benjamin. And Dr. Benjamin is the director of the Medical College of Wisconsin's Cardiovascular Center. He is also a professor of cardiology in the Department of Medicine and also holds uh, appointments as a professor in the Departments of Physiology, Pharmacology and Toxicology, Cell Biology, Neurobiology and Anatomy, and the Department of Surgery. So, <laughs> That's quite a mouthful. Did I get that right? <laughs> you got that right. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. Congratulations. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Benjamin. Well, let's start. You're originally from Guyana, correct? That's correct. And then you went on to college in New York City at Hunter College. That's correct. What, what brought you to the United States? Uh, wonderful question. And I think it's uh, one for which um, I have to really uh, give uh, all the credit to my parents. Uh, they wanted um, the best life possible for their kids. And um, I was extraordinarily fortunate to have parents who were visionary enough to support us um, and in their interest to provide us uh, where the only boundaries would be our God-given talents and cognitive abilities. Uh, they elected to emigrate from Guyana uh, when I was a teenager. Now um, there is some history to this because um, it turns out that um, I do have a family including a grandmother who came through Ellis Island. And in fact, uh, my middle name, that Ivor James, um, belongs to Jim Murrow, who was one of the first physicians in my family. And uh, he emigrated from Guyana since uh, the late 1800s. So there's sort of a history, uh, a legacy of um, us uh, moving uh, to different places. And here's where we are. And where in the United States did your family move? Well, that's right. So we first came to Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. So my uh, First uh, apartment is in uh, Prospect Park, uh, Brooklyn. Um, we lived uh, also uh, not too far from the Brooklyn Public Library. I know that extremely well because obviously uh, I went to college, as you mentioned, at Hunter College. But um, yeah, it's, um, I do have incredibly fond memories um, of, of, of those early days. When did you decide that you wanted to be, go into medicine? It's a great question. Um, and actually, it goes back to my early formative uh, years uh, in Guyana. Um, I, <laughs> I, I like to tell the story that in addition, I mentioned to you there was already a physician in my family, but early on I actually wanted to be a, an airline pilot or, <laughs> or a lawyer. Um, I, uh, as they say, some of my best friends are lawyers, so <laughs> I won't tell you the reason why um, that did not. But I think I more or less um, gravitated to wanting to commit myself to service, to helping others, and uh, medicine um, became a very natural fit for me. You went to medical school at Johns Hopkins University, right. one of the nation's premier medical schools. Why Johns Hopkins? What led to your decision to go there? So um, w while in college, um, I realized very early on that mentors play an enormously impactful role in, in, in all that we do. And while at uh, Johns Hopkins, um, I met Dr. Frank Douglas, who was also a Guyanese, but at that time he was at uh, Cornell uh, University uh, Medical School. And as you know, uh, in New York City, um, Hunter College is just four blocks away. They're long city blocks but they're four blocks away from Cornell. But um, he had gone on to Johns Hopkins for his internship and residency. And when I was fortunate enough to get into Hopkins, um, I think it really was a defining uh, and really had a huge impact on my subsequent uh, professional growth and development. Was it while you were in medical school, in medical school you decided that um, cardiology was the area of your interest, or did that uh, come when you were doing your residency and internship? It actually goes back uh, even before that. Um, I like to tell the story about my grandmother, my favorite grandmother. But it actually turns out that um, my mom was a strict uh, disciplinarian, and uh, she really wanted to have her kids within her eyesight. But my grandmother and I actually had a secret pack. Yeah, when she would take off the market, I could go with grandma and 
I could play as much as I want so long as I went back home with her. But then, tragically, my grandmother had a stroke. And um, my life just went from, oh my goodness, here is grandma, to where she, of course, developed a very dense hemiparesis. And went from independence to dependence. And in fact, uh, I slept in the same room with my grandmother. I was directly involved with helping to feed her because obviously she lost the use of uh, one side of her body. And uh, I was only nine years old. But it had a profound impact um, to just see and understand what uh, might be uh, the factors that are involved in that. And to sort of cut to the chase, um, I also saw similar patterns in my own mother. Um, at the time, of course, I didn't know anything about an EKG, but uh, my mother subsequently had uh, a risk factor, and that risk factor was hypertension. Hypertension then causes uh, atrial fibrillation. Now, I was an intern and resident when my own mom was having some of these uh, issues, but I could only surmise that my grandmother <laughs> herself had hypertension, probably had atrial fibrillation, and of course, you know, I'm in cardiology, and I know today that um, the biggest risk factor for, you know, having embolic stroke is atrial fibrillation, and I'm a cardiologist, and uh, I see those issues all the time, so in fact, I actually do research on atrial fibrillation in my laboratory. Now, after you graduated from medical school at Johns Hopkins, you then went on for both your internship and your residency training in internal medicine at Yale University. That's correct. And what, what were some of the events or uh, individuals that you encountered at Yale that perhaps helped define your career? I would say that um, it's quite uh, a perceptive question. Um, I, when I was at Hopkins, I actually did a um, one a rotation, an away rotation at Yale. And I came on the tutelage of one Dr. Lawrence Cohen. Um, he and I are still friends today, so much so he was a cardiologist. Um, we developed uh, a great intense bond, uh, perhaps because he was also from New York City. But more importantly, I just liked his approach to the care of patients. He was a master clinician. He um, began to then foster and develop uh, my own interests, so much so that uh, when my first child was born, Lawrence, I actually named him in his honor. After you completed your residency training, you went on for fellowships at Michael Reese Hospital and Medical Center in Chicago. Something that you know, right? Uh, yes, yes. Well, I, that's where I did my internship as well in public that's right. relations. That's right. Um, and uh, then you were also at uh, Duke University mm -hmm. and at University of Texas Southwestern in Dallas. Sure. These were all premier heart programs in the United States. Yes. What, what did you gain from those experiences? Oh my goodness, that's, a, that's, a, that's, that, that, that's incredibly powerful. I tell you what's the common thread that uh, really epitomized my experiences. Um, after residency training, I was extremely fortunate to be at a time when the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation really um, set out to increase the number of underrepresented uh, minority faculty in the nation's medical schools. I applied for and I was fortunate to actually um, get one of these um, Robert Wood Johnson Foundations. But what it also did was it put me on a glide path, if you will, to really identify the nation's best mentors, research mentors. It also uh, provided um, a mentoring network that really placed the emphasis on what it really we took to become a premier investigator. So having not done a PhD during my medical training, I had done some research, but what this really did is that it provided the critical protected time. So my time both at Duke, and I can tell, come back and tell you a little bit, as well as at Southwestern, was uh, to identify my mentor who, again, I still uh, I'm very close with uh, today. His name is Dr. R. Sanders Williams. You call him Sandy Williams. But um, through that experience, um, I actually basically went and did uh, almost full-time research. And that was more in the area of molecular cardiology, 
which um, clearly was um, a, a new area for uh, all of uh, cardiovascular sciences. But I recognize that um, cardiology was moving into the molecular revolution. And I was very fortunate to be on the leading edge of the curve. And uh, that's really what uh, was very defining. So by the time I spent two years with um, Sandy at Duke, he was picked to be the chief of cardiology at UT Southwestern. And I accompanied him there and actually did additional training, believe it or not, in yeast genetics. Uh, yeast don't have a heart, but uh, there are some fundamental pathways that you can understand. And I became incredibly interested in um, a family of genes that encode for proteins that are called heat shock proteins. These are particular proteins that help to, um, like for example, fee, uh, speed the rate of physiological recovery after a heart attack. But um, it really basically set the foundations for my scientific interests. And uh, those interests, uh, fortunately enough, um, have resulted in a, in a fantastic ride over these many decades. Well, in fact, one of the things that's uh, remarkable in your career is that you have such a strong basic science background uh, as a physician. And um, as we noted earlier, you have appointments in basic science departments here at MCW, in physiology, pharmacology, and toxicology, yep. cell biology. But you'd also had appointments in biochemistry right. uh, earlier. <laughs> and so, I mean, you, you've covered the gamut in the basic sciences. <laughs> well, of course, I've got the, uh, all the stripes to show for it, gray hair. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about the research focus that you had. And you mentioned it was in, in molecular cardiology. Sure. And so, so is this something that a strand that continued through your work at Duke and at Southwestern and carried on to other institutions? That absolutely, well? absolutely. Well, um, I recognized that um, as much as I love patient care, and I think I'm you know, a pretty good doc, <laughs> and I still see patients, uh, my practice is limited to an inpatient practice. I'm able to uh, be at the bedside. I'm able to participate and uh, bring my skills as a, as a clinician to uh, training of medical students. I teach um, within, uh, for example, our second year uh, medical uh, you know, cardiovascular pathway. But I also recognize that um, I had the unique opportunity to also uh, be informed by my patients and be able to take those questions to the laboratory. Because I really think that that is really where uh, true advances can be made. All of the advances that we have now, someone else uh, was intrigued by it and uh, he or she elected to go and push the envelope to basically try to discover something that uh, no one has gone before. And I think that that really took a while to, for you to get comfortable with that training. But once you really have the training, I think that there isn't any better place to be than to be a physician scientist. Because um, recognizing that, of course, much of that is dependent on being able to form effective teams. But um, I did not, in my training, um, take a shortcut. It required uh, four years of uh, postdoctoral training, like I said, both in molecular cardiology as well as in uh, molecular biology and yeast genetics. And, uh, but that was really foundational because it then set me on a, on a trajectory so that I can really not be encumbered. I think the second thing that I would say is that I just happened to be in, at first-rate institutions. Going to uh, UT Southwestern Medical Center meant that I then um, had, at that time, four Nobel Prize laureates who you could see in a conference, who you could go by and, and talk to. But it just basically cascaded throughout the organization this sense of um, setting excellence um, for yourself and, of course, being in a position to um, have colleagues where you can be asking questions with cutting-edge technologies. And that's really what I'm hoping to basically bring and we already have that existing here at the Medical College of Wisconsin and within the Cardiovascular Center, but certainly um, it's, uh, it's, it's stayed with me throughout. Well, in fact, when you were, you, after you finished your fellowship, you became a faculty member and, and rose through the ranks uh, <laughs> rather, rather quickly well, at UT Southwestern, which, right. as you noted, is, is one of the premier 
institutions in the nation, especially in some of the basic sciences in, in heart research. And so it's a, it was a remarkable opportunity and a remarkable institution. There's no question about that. I mean, I, of course, you know, I uh, came to the institution um, after, but um, as you know, Brangen and Goldstein um, basically spent their professional life at UT Southwestern. And they are obviously crack the secrets to uh, high cholesterol and of course, uh, many of the subsequent uh, medications that we are, are that are common use today um, were actually uh, discovered, as well as um, the trajectory for their implementation um, was basically laid in their labs. After you teach Southwestern, you then moved on to the University of Utah. What what uh, led you to Utah? What were the opportunities that that brought you there? It was primarily a leadership opportunity. Um, I think that um, UT Southwestern was a was a was a fabulous place, and um, we were able to actually have a number of uh, important grants um, that I had been awarded. But when the opportunity came to go to the University of Utah as the Division Chief of Cardiology. Um, it was one that um, I felt at the time uh, I would like to undertake. Um, of course, um, I had not um, spent much time in, in, the, in the Mountain West, but uh, it was a great time because um, I am most fond of um, the opportunity to really raise my own family um, in, in, a, in one of the most spectacularly um, and terrific places um, in the country. In 2013, yeah. you came to MCW. Yeah. Let's talk about your first impressions of MCW and who are some of the people that you met here and why did you feel that this was an institution that you wanted to become part of? Great question. <laughs> um, well, by the time I uh, thought about uh, the Medical College of Wisconsin, um, what really attracted me was um, the opportunity to to look at the cardiovascular program, look at the cardiovascular center. Um, I should point out to you that um, when I was interviewing, um, very early on I met Dr. John Raymond. And Dr. Raymond and I were actually fellows together at Duke University Medical Center. That's correct. <laughs> which, <laughs> which was quite remarkable. But there's no question, um, I was incredibly impressed uh, with the leadership, uh, obviously Dr. Joe Kirshner, uh, as the dean and Dr. Roy Silverstein as the department chair of medicine. Mm -hmm. What were your impressions of the programs that we already had in place, both the patient care programs as well as the uh, the basic science research that was being conducted here? Well, I really think that this is one of the secrets that um, we need to continue to keep uh, really um, selling, and maybe it has to do with the modesty of the of the Midwest, but. Uh, barring none, um, I think that the cardiovascular program, particularly in the basic science area, is outstanding. Um, you know, when you sort of think about the entire uh, research uh, extramural portfolio for the Medical College of Wisconsin, it's about $160 million. But just in the cardiovascular area alone, it's $43 million, just from the NHLBI, which is one of the institutes of, um, of course, the NIH. We bring in north of uh, $22 million a year. And this is obviously built on the, on the shoulders of uh, some outstanding uh, programs and individuals, be it in physiology and what Dr. Alan Cowley and his colleagues have done over the years with uh, the rat uh, uh, genome and uh, hypertension, unlocking the genetics of hypertension. These were all, but um, that in no way takes away from um, other areas um, where uh, phenomenal work is being done by men and women of all stripes. Well, in fact, let's talk about some of these programs. You mentioned physiology, mm -hmm. and that is a program that has really done quite a bit of research and a lot of uh, you know uh, advances in the area of hypertension. Yep. What do you consider the significant contributions that have come from physiology? Well, one of the things um, that sets the Department of Physiology apart from, in fact, probably is the number one ranked 
um, in, the, in, in the country was how the, the questions that were being addressed were constantly at the forefront. The idea that we can now begin to start to have a better understanding of the genetic factors underlying hypertension that then, for example, led to a spin-off uh, with uh, Dr. Howard Jacob, you know, being the director of the uh, Human Molecular Genetics um, Center, um, really being able to recognize the value of team science. I really think that that is something that um, set Alan Cowley. He recognized that uh, you had to form these teams. And um, of course, one um, mark of distinction for an investigator is to get an independent award called an RO1 grant. But a collection of investigators who are RO1 eligible can now have what's called a program project grant. There isn't, there isn't anyone at this campus who has been as successful for as long a period of time. And there's no question, he um, undeniably has set the bar and set it pretty high. And as you know, I'm his immediately, immediate successor <laughs> to the, as the director. Big, big shoes to I've fill. I've got big shoes to fill. But I really think that that really tells you that team, when teams come together, and, and I think that that's one of the things that attracted me to the Medical College of Wisconsin Cardiovascular Center. I'd pretty much done one of everything. I just uh, finished winning an NIH uh, Director's Pioneer Award. But really, uh, what I see as um, the, the, where I can potentially have uh, the greatest mark is, is to be part of a, a team where one's accomplishments wouldn't be measured by what you yourself did as an individual, but what a collection of people um, can do. And I, I really think that that's, uh, I'll be happy to tell you a little bit more about how we're thinking about proceeding with that. Well, and one of the other, one of the other areas then is pharmacology and toxicology under Dr. Campbell's leadership, another individual who had been at UT Southwestern. What, what is it that pharmacology is bringing to the mix? in cardiovascular research? Well, I am extraordinarily excited about um, our collaboration. As you said, you know, uh, I think that uh, Bill Campbell was on my selection committee. So <laughs> had we not been good friends at Southwestern, I don't think I would be here. So thank you, Bill. <laughs> but I think um, here, here is something that we're really excited about. Um, the Department of Pharmacology under the, obviously, Dr. Campbell's leadership and more specifically, you know, John Emig's, Dr. Emig's leadership, has something called the Therapeutics Accelerator Program. And uh, we are really excited that uh, the Cardiovascular Center is going to establish a partnership with the uh, Therapeutics Accelerator Program that we call the, the Smith Family Precision Therapeutics Pilot Program. And so here's a major benefactor, the Smith family has really been generous enough to uh, provide that support to the cardiovascular center. And so through this partnership, investigators who are in a cardiovascular center are going to be able to apply for seed grants. These grants may either have to do with existing drugs that can be repurposed for treating cardiovascular disease, but just as well, there may be new drugs that can be coming to pipeline. We are all aware of something called the valley of death. And one of the things to appreciate is that basic scientists are really good at um, making new discoveries. It might be in a test tube, it might be in a petri dish, it might be in an animal model. But while all, they all you know, dream of you know, maybe taking something ultimately to impact a patient, there's a whole set of skill sets that you need that are not immediately for um, at that person's uh, disposal. So this partnership that we're going to have and facilitated by philanthropic support um, is really going to put us in a, in a very, very different uh, stage. So we're very excited about that partnership. Now, another program that has had a major commitment to cardiovascular research is our Department of Anesthesiology, where they bridge the basic sciences and the clinical sciences um, 
Well, tell me about the contributions they bring to cardiovascular research. Well, you know, um, there are many that I can obviously talk about, and obviously uh, Dr. David Waltier building on a tradition of excellence in the department that goes back to Carl Papin, um, you know, is, is, is really uh, quite notable. But in particular, um, we are now collaborating, I have a very strong collaboration with Dr. Jelko Bosnia. And uh, he, for example, is very much interested in the consequences of um, anesthetics um, in the area of, um, you know, brain and, and cognitive uh, development and other consequences after anesthesiology. One of the contributions, um, you know, that the Department of Anesthesiology has made was the fact that there are certain anesthetic agents um, that can actually uh, precondition the heart. And, um, you know, that is a, uh, that actually goes back to an observation made by Jennings and Reimer with a, um, at the time, a graduate student by the name of Chuck Murray. So, and it's a, it's a, sm it's a very, since this is a history project, I should point out to you that my graduate, um, you know, my, one of my graduate students just left for Chuck Murray's lab at the University of Washington. But this phenomena that Jennings and Reimer discovered was this whole concept of preconditioning, where short periods of ischemia, maybe three to five minutes. Almost like little heart attacks. Th 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 that's right, little heart attacks can then set up the, the, the organ, if you will, when subjected to a longer period, one can then observe significant protection. It actually turns out the heat shock response is similar to that. If you were just to precondition cells with a short burst of, of heat, then to a subsequent longer challenge, those cells that had some pre-heat shock now are able to survive much longer. Now we know that heat was the trigger for initiation, initiating a cascade of events at the molecular level resulting in the synthesis of particular proteins that then help those cells to better withstand that long period of stress. So the similarities, again, between heat shock and preconditioning. But in particular, um, the work done in this department of anesthesiology showed that uh, there are certain anesthetic agents that can actually uh, cause preconditioning. You mentioned before Dr. Howard Jacob and the genetic center here. And now as we move forward with our genetics program, that is also a program that has been very engaged because much of their work in the past has really been focused on the genetics of heart disease. Yes, it, it certainly has. And, and so, of course, we are very much uh, excited, looking forward to the new HMGC uh, director joining us, has an interest in epigenetics. Clearly, um, but, um, you know, heart disease still uh, is the number one killer of Wisconsinites. And I think that um, the Medical College of Wisconsin, its major centers, really needs to continue to focus on improving um, the health for all Wisconsinites. So we, no question, need to be in collaboration. So that's a very important collaboration. I'm very much interested, of course, in the direction of precision cardiovascular medicine. That tends to be sort of a big buzzword, but what it means is that we can actually um, incorporate someone's environmental as well as their genetic um, aspects into being able to tailor both the diagnosis but potentially uh, therapies that are targeted, that are specific, that are really being able to uh, facilitate uh, their own advancement while, if you will, avoiding uh, unnecessary side effects. Earlier you'd mentioned your family history and engagement with stroke. Yeah. And, and stroke is, is also called a, a, a brain attack, like oh, a yes. heart attack. Yep. And Dr. David Harder has done significant work uh, in that area as well as on brain aneurysms. And so that's another component of the cardiovascular center as well, isn't it? Well, you bring up, yeah, again, you know, the founding director for the cardiovascular center. And I'm very excited about this I, and, and talking about uh, David uh, Harder in particular. 
1992, he had the brilliant idea and was obviously able to get institutional support for uh, starting what I happen to be and many others are beneficiary today. So this happens to be the year that we will be celebrating our 25th anniversary. I am sort of the third uh, director in that 25-year history. So yeah, I am standing on the shoulders of giants, and both David Harder and Alan Cowley are my immediate predecessors. And fortunately enough, they're still around. So I think that when I uh, screw something up, <laughs> I'll have a chance to say, hey, OK. <laughs> well, now but, you, oh, go ahead. but on the contrary, yeah, these are just, um, I, I think it speaks volume to an institution where these, uh, these individuals have elected uh, to be here and to really uh, make their contributions. So um, I've got much um, uh, opportunity to, uh, and I have received their, their wise counsel, um, and, and it's, a, it's a joy and privilege you know, to have them around. Now, on the clinical side, you've got strong departments to work with as well in that um, in the Department of Surgery, we have cardiothoracic surgery and uh, some great work going on there. Pediatrics, Department of Medicine and Cardiology. What are, what are some of the activities that are going on on the clinical side that engage the cardiovascular center? Well, we are, we are continuing to build those stronger ties between the cardiovascular center and our clinical programs. I think that um, there are specific areas where we're going to continue to, to strengthen um, cardiothoracic um, surgery. Um, there are new um, opportunities, for example, in transaortic valve replacement, which is um, a technology that is going to clearly, that has clearly revolutionized. Um, this is a technology in which one is able to fix a diseased aortic valve um, by actually a, a percutaneous procedure. Um, and clearly there are patients who are at highest risk for surgery who are currently considered candidates uh, for this procedure, but it will continue to cascade. Um, just, one just has to look at how vascular surgery has evolved. One doesn't necessarily need um, much of being able to replace a diseased aortic valve is done endoscopically, i.e. At, at the tip of uh, some catheter. So those are areas where we're going to continue to make uh, those advances. The cardiovascular center, however, is, in my opinion, needs to be at the, 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 the needs to play a foundational role in areas where we currently do not have existing answers. And let me give you two examples. The first example is a condition called heart failure with uh, preserved ejection fraction. So normally, uh, when the heart fails, it's actually more a syndrome. It, it refers to the inability of the heart to meet the peripheral oxygen demands. So people will have certain signs and symptoms. And for the most part, uh, the type that we used to recognize more commonly was let's say after a heart attack. And if you lose muscle cells, then you have much less muscle to work with. And because the heart is a muscle pump, the pump begins to fail. You have heart failure. But now we're recognizing within this spectrum of heart failure, patients whose muscle function otherwise appear OK, they're able to basically get in excess of 50%, uh, 60% of uh, the ejection uh, fraction, it's called the ejection fraction, but still they have symptoms of heart failure. And so we really don't understand the mechanisms, and just as well, we don't have effective therapies. Phenomenal advances just within the last 25 years with beta blockers, angiotensin converting uh, enzyme inhibitors, as well as many other uh, ACE inhibitors, we actually are able to significantly reduce the morbidity and mortality for patients with heart failure, which reduce the infection fraction. When we try those therapies in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, 
the clinical trials have been abysmal. That means that we have to go back to the laboratory. We need to work on better phenotyping those patients to really be able to unlock the secrets so that we can basically, and in particular why I feel strongly about this is that it particularly uh, affects um, underrepresented minorities, particularly African Americans. Uh, women also seem to be at a higher risk for heart failure with preserved ejection fractions. So without that knowledge that will come from basic research, we will not be able to tackle this uh, key and important area. So, so I will put that as really an, an important one. The other one that I'm very excited about is in the area of cell therapy. Um, in my mind, in the next uh, five to 10, maybe even 15 years, uh, while we think about stem cells, um, and we, most people will sort of think about um, embryonic stem cells, and there's a whole set of issues that are associated with trying to take a stem cell from an embryo. Just in 2006, a Japanese investigator and his colleagues, his name is Shimi Yamanaka, um, between 2006 and 2007, they were able to publish two seminal papers that provided, if you will, an entirely new technology, which is one in which we can take basically your peripheral cells, your blood cells, or even your skin fibroblasts, and in a petri dish, expose those cells to certain factors. And now, under those conditions, you can now create a new class of cells that are called human-induced pluripotent stem cells. Human IPS, for short, under yet additional conditions, can be coaxed to become a heart cell. They can be coaxed to become a neuron. They can be coaxed to become, a, for example, a nephron, a kidney cell. So now you have whole new vistas available to investigators in the laboratory to really be studying inheritable diseases. And so we're learning more about these human-induced pluripotent stem cells. We think that these cells not only can give us insights to understanding the basic biology, the basic mechanisms, we we'll be able to even screen for new therapies in the laboratory, but just as well, these might be cells that can be used in cell therapy uh, protocols to really be able to uh, salvage uh, the heart and many other organs. Now, it's as we look at the, uh, the definition of cardiovascular diseases, um, in the past, you know, heart diseases came to mind, stroke, hypertension, but now as more research has been done, what we're learning is that perhaps some of the kidney diseases, diabetes, uh, Alzheimer's disease may also be part of the family of cardiovascular disease as well. So in many respects, the scope uh, and the engagement of other departments is really important now for the cardiovascular center. Well, um, we've been speaking for a few minutes here, but the comment that you just made is not only quite profound, but uh, you are really onto something. And I'll tell you why. The way we have been trained is to really be able to think in terms of organs. I become a cardiologist, so I think about the heart. I become a nephrologist, so I think about the kidney. Um, I become a neurologist, I think about the brain. But you're absolutely right. In fact, I just wrote a grant <laughs> <laughs> to point out that that way of thinking is quite frankly um, obsolete. We are not dealing anymore with organ-specific issues. There is something called the cardiorenal syndrome. It's a condition where effects of the heart, effects of the kidney, there are these, constant, there are these consequences where there appears to be this crosstalk. You mentioned Alzheimer's disease. The epidemiologic data, and just happened to sort of be reviewing this information very recently, you would think that after someone begins to have decline in their cognitive function, that, oh my goodness, you know, you're not able to think that well, and that's why they're having a decline in their cardiac function or their skeletal muscle function. Well, it actually turns out that that is not just uh, one being the consequence of the other, but they might in fact be syndromes. 
And the concept of thinking of these as syndromes, we've not quite frankly been able to crack the nut on Alzheimer's disease. And I think that one of the areas of research, um, the term is actually called proteostasis. But what that means is the quality control of the proteins of the entire pro uh, and, and the conglomerate of proteins are called your proteome. You know, as you talked about some of your work before, mm -hmm. it sounds like the description of what we're trying to achieve with the Clinical and Translational Science Institute, bringing patient care back to the lab, bringing the work to the uh, bedside so that we can speed the process of having new therapies, new treatments. Right. What has been your engagement, what should be the engagement of the Cardiovascular Center with the Clinical and Translational Science Institute? Absolutely. So, so this is an important question. And the way that we are doing it is that we already have, the, so there are formal and there are informal collaborations. But I think in particularly with the CTSI um, is the, the way in which we are approaching team science. And so what we have developed within the Cardiovascular Center is and, and I actually inherited, if you will, a collection of people, if you will, forming what we call affinity groups. So there can be a hypertension affinity group. We've um, now, if you will, um, created new programs that we are incredibly excited about. And in particular, we want for our affinity groups to graduate into one of three levels of what we call destination signature programs. And so, that really is a chance for us to facilitate team science. Team science, so, so there is, if you will, a bronze center, a silver center, a gold center. Ultimately, uh, the gold standard is about first in human trials, really being able to have new therapies that have a direct impact to patients uh, in their communities. So community engagement is, is particularly in, important. And I think that these are all the goals that a CTSI would like to be able to accomplish. So back to collaboration and partnership. One of the other opportunities that you've had at MCW is to engage with the Advancing a Healthier Wisconsin Endowment that we've received. Uh, this remarkable gift from the Blue Cross Blue Shield conversion yep has enabled MCW to provide funding support for key areas, and you and the Cardiovascular Center have been beneficiaries of this. What has it meant to you and to the program to have the support from the Advancing a Healthier Wisconsin Endowment? I think, I, you know, I, I, I really feel that um, that was not something that I appreciated as much prior to coming to the Medical College of Wisconsin, but it's really the bedrock. Advancing a Healthy Wisconsin is about that. You have to invest in your mission and vision. And the mission of the Cardiovascular Center is to improve cardiovascular health through cutting edge research. We believe that we should be about training the next generation of leaders. And we must be able to have all of us participate in our respective communities. That's what AHW. So if you go to the CVC's uh, mission statement, uh, I think it embodies AHW. Cardiovascular disease has been identified as one of MCW's priority areas, as well as the neurosciences and the cancer center as well. What do you see as the engagement of the cardiovascular center with the cancer center, with the neurosciences research center? Very, very, very perceptive question, Dick. <laughs> really, you, you, you just happen to be asking all the questions I love to talk about. Let me tell you about an exciting program that we're doing right now with the Cancer Center. Um, we have made a commitment to um, the NCI uh, designation, and I think that the Cardiovascular Center can play uh, a particularly important way. There are whole new disciplines that are occurring as we speak in which life-saving cancer drugs are in fact having side effects and some of those side effects actually affect the heart causing heart failure it's created a whole new discipline called cardio oncology so in collaboration with our cancer center we now are supporting what we call pre-ppg awards 
were promoting team science in the area of cardio-oncology. It fits into this same concept of destination signature programs, and we think we're going to be able to leverage the amazing talent and science of cardiovascular investigators. By the way, that's already happening now, but in this particular case, they can now be addressing real-world issues so that not only would you get a cure for cancer, but we hope that it will also be free of cardiovascular disease. Very interesting. As you look at your career, you know, starting when you were at Johns Hopkins to today, and your interest in, you know, the, the work that's been going on in cardiovascular research, what do you consider the major successes? What, what has really moved things forward um, throughout the world in terms of cardiovascular disease? What was the state when you started? What is the state today? <laughs> Well, you know, um, I like to think that uh, I only started there just a few years ago. <laughs> but on the contrary, there is no doubt in my mind that there are life-saving therapies. And I think that statins, you know, the idea of lowering cholesterol. I once had a pathologist shared with me about 10, 15 years ago that compared with when I was doing anatomy class and you could see these very diseased uh, large vessels. Uh, statins have basically remodeled our internal organs so that we don't have to deal with those kinds of issues. So I think that, I think that there are some major therapies that have fundamentally, uh, and so in fact, um, the decline in heart disease approaches 6 to 7% since the mid-60s so that um, we are able to have much, much more um, longevity um, in, in that particular time. There's no question that there are new technologies, and uh, those technologies are more endovascular, and they've been able to do that. Clearly, we think that um, stents and everything else have really been able to revolutionize. So now I think the, the new frontier is about dealing with chronic diseases. And those are going to be less um, straightforward. I think it has to do more with, uh, again, an area of research that I got into in terms of understanding how proteins in our cells fold and misfold. We think that those chronic diseases are going to have a huge and important impact. And uh, it's going to require um, a great deal of uh, very smart people uh, being engaged and involved. Um, and um, I, um, it's been a great ride uh, for me. I think that there is still something more left in there, but um, uh, that's, that's, that's the new frontier. Earlier, you've talked about some of the mentors that you've had. Mm -hmm. you've, been a, you've, you've had the opportunity to work with remarkable people at some of the nation's major research centers. Mm -hmm. But conversely, you also mentioned that you're a teacher. And Absolutely. you've had the opportunity to have young researchers, graduate students, residents, yeah. young faculty that you've worked with. Um, as you look at some of the people that you've worked with, whose careers that you've helped influence, mm -hmm. well, I'm sure you're proud of them all, who are some of the people that come to mind who have been able to move on and really develop their own careers? Great question. Um, I would say that um, there are several. And as you mentioned, um, I have had uh, investigators who have come to my own laboratory. And it turns out that uh, science is a discipline uh, with no borders. And so many of my trainees have uh, left the uh, United States and they've become deans, they've become department chairs as far away um, as China, they are in Germany. They're in France. They're in different parts of the world. I've also had trainees who have gone on and um, gotten their own independent uh, research laboratories and have gotten the coveted R01. And I would like to think that right here at the Medical College of Wisconsin, we have uh, young trainees. They're no longer trainees, but they are now, if you will, having their established uh, laboratories, Dr. Jennifer Strand, Dr. Nicole Lohr. Um, you know, Dr. Squires, 
Um, we have many others who um, I wouldn't necessarily consider them to be individuals who are under my direct, um, you know, they didn't train with me, but whatever it is that I could share as a mentor, um, as someone who is um, had who has been given uh, much along the way, um, I think that the, the highest privilege is to really be able to um, share it with others and what I like to say, pay forward. The scope of MCW is growing uh, and one of the things that we will be opening this fall is our new School of Pharmacy. As you look at the development of a School of Pharmacy and the potential for perhaps other programs in the future, how do you see them engaging with the Cardiovascular Center? Well, I'm incredibly excited uh, to have um, as our founding dean, Dr. George McKinnon. Um, there's no question he's a visionary. Um, I have uh, been a very strong fan um, of his concept of uh, community pharmacy. The idea that um, the pharmacist could really be the person that uh, individuals need to really be able to, um, uh, to, to really be key and important members um, of, of the team. And what I like to say is that the healthcare team is not just the doctor, it's not the provider and the patient. The, the, the healthcare team, we currently have uh, pharmacists uh, that are embedded in our inpatient teams. There's no question that that's key and important. I just as well think that um, as we begin to move into the future, pharmacogenomics, the idea that your response to a drug would be more than just, if you will, here, look, take this particular drug and see what ha happens. But now we can be more predictive and prescriptive, and I think that the, the pharmacist can play an important role. So again, the Cardiovascular Center, HMGC, I mean, these are, these are all new exciting areas, and um, George is particularly um, very forward-thinking in that respect, and uh, that's also a very exciting partnership. In the period of time that you've been at the medical college, we've already seen significant changes and growth that have occurred, but what's the same? Is there something about the, the culture here, the personality of the institution that you know, is, is um, the same through the years. So, so I want to be sure, you, you want to, you, in other words, what, what's the constant? What, what, yes. what is, what's well, yeah. the constant? What, 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 what's the constant? Mm -hmm. I think that there is a uh, core commitment to excellence. And I think that um, while there, that might not be true across the board in other areas, I think that we have to keep in mind uh, being in the upper third uh, ranking and NIH rankings, um, isn't something that uh, came lightly. I mentioned many individuals. I think that we cannot um, uh, stop to be complacent at all. And I really think the um, real opportunity that I find to be the most exciting is that you know, we gr you know, I grew up on the three pillars of uh, the clinical, the education, and the research. But I think that there is no question and what is incredibly exciting here at the medical college is it's focused on community engagement. We have, um, it, 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 it can be said that we're in a very segregated city and as you know, the social determinants of health has huge impact on people's lives. And I think that um, the medical college and its affiliated partners, um, and I've heard the dean say it and I know John Raymond feels the same way too. Uh, and I agree with Dean Kirshner that we have a moral responsibility to make an impact on our community. So I do see our human laboratory as Southeast Wisconsin. We've covered a lot of territory. Is there anything I failed to ask you that perhaps we should be discussing? Yes. Um, I would not be sitting here if it was not for my family. I owe everything to an amazing wife, um, three lovely children. Um, I've got, uh, I've been extraordinarily blessed and extraordinarily fa uh, fortunate. And uh, that's what I will put um, highest among my accomplishments in life to, to be a husband, a father, and you know, even a son-in-law. 
Thank you, Dr. Benjamin, and thank you for all that you've done uh, here at the Medical College of Wisconsin. Thank you.